So welcome, it's so great to see this great crowd here to listen to us tell you about this great journey that we had. And we'll be talking about climate action and social democracy, lessons learned from the Nordic countries. So first I want to uh, introduce us. I'm Fran Putnam from Weybridge. This is my husband, Spence. Uh, I wanted to make sure you know that these are only our opinions. And these are things that we glean through talking to people and reading. We're not experts, we're not journalists, we're not professors. Uh, we're citizens who were curious about what was going on in the Nordic countries. So we we spent quite a bit of time here um, in the last 12 years or so working on different different aspects of climate activism. And at some point uh, last summer we said, you know what, we need some inspiration. We need some new ideas. Things are feeling a little, um, well, stop, there you go, okay. So that's when we decided to, to take, this, uh, take this journey. So um, we will be going through the slides and talking about various things. And then at the end, we have a good 20 minutes, 25 minutes for questions. So if you please hold your questions till the end, and uh, there will be plenty of time, I hope, for you to uh, get some answers. All right. So where did we go? We went to Denmark, little country right here, and then Sweden, Norway, and Iceland. And we learned that these are all Nordic countries, but Scandinavia is right here, and Iceland is not part of Scandinavia. So when we say Scandinavia and Iceland, that's why. Um, th this is an overview of what we'll be talking about today. We're going to talk about the Nordic model and how it works, and that will be general about all four of the countries. And we're going to be talking about Samso Island, a small community in Denmark, and then Akureyri, Iceland, another small community, and at the end, uh, question and answer and discussion. So, this is why we went. How many of you heard George Lakey when he was here a couple of years ago? Okay. So George Lakey wrote this book, Viking Economics, How the Scandinavians Got It Right and How We Can Too, about three or four years ago. And Spence read the book and he said, you have to read this book. So then we read the book and then Molly Anderson, who's here, uh, invited George to come and speak to Middlebury College and some other groups. He has deep and wide experience in Scandinavia, especially Norway. So he's very interested in, in the Nordic model and how their society works. He was also interested in, obviously, uh, how they're dealing with climate change. So those are two things that, that we're very interested in. So that's why we went to those countries. How's the sound working? Still too loud? Okay. Too, too loud, okay, I'll bring it down. No. <laughs> All right, well, before I get too far into this, I just want to say that um, one of the reasons, actually the main reason that I'm here tonight is because of my grandchildren. Two of them are here tonight, and a third is, lives in White River Junction, and uh, this is the part where I try not to cry. <laughs> But seriously, we, we are concerned about the future of their generation and the plants and animals and the future of the whole planet, actually. But they give us inspiration every day. So, Eliza and Colt, right here. All right, we interviewed a lot of people. Uh, you can see the list. Um, here I am interviewing two aides to a member of parliament in uh, the, the Swedish parliament. And the, their minister, no, their, their member of parliament was um, uh, involved with the Environment and Energy Committee. So they met with us, and people were so generous. They were so kind, and not only would they answer our questions, they also sent us to the next person. So we just went from one to another, and we got these people from the center party. We saw and heard from people in just about every every imaginable place, even in the laundromat. <laughs> All right. Well, this is what we observed. 
a strong commitment to fair taxation. And this is where we'll be talking about the Nordic model. People uh, in Norway, everybody knows what everybody's taxes are because they publish it in the newspaper. So, you know. Yeah, their income tax returns. They have an overall sense of security because of the services that they receive. They don't worry about um, amassing a lot of money so they can send their kids to college or, or um, get help with a medical emergency. This, they do that through their taxes. So they know they're going to be well taken care of. It's a highly educated population all the way from birth to post-secondary and on into workforce retraining in, in um, midlife. And they're very proud of that. They accept the scientific evidence of climate change. We did not meet any climate deniers. And we never even, we asked people, do you have climate deniers? They said no. Even the most right-wing party, which is not very far right-wing really, they don't deny the science, they just aren't sure what the best way is to get there. Citizens seem to have faith in their governments. <laughs> Isn't that nice? It was, it was uh, you know, they, they have quibbles, they don't accept everything, but in general they have faith in their government to do what they want them to do. Um, they're willing to support government with taxes. And we talked to people about taxes and there was nobody who said, no, my taxes are too high. They said, no, they're fair. We get good value from what we pay. And then finally, the European Union plays quite a big role in, in all of these countries, even though two of them are not actually part of the European Union. Um, but the European Union makes a lot of regulations that deal with um, things that deal with the climate, and if you want to trade with them, then you have to adhere to those. So, in summary, um, the Nordic... No, not in summary. <laughs> That's the next slide. Um, the core aspects of the Nordic model are the public provision of universal social services, and I stress universal, everybody gets it. You don't have to be low income to get help with your health care. Everybody gets it all the services. They invest heavily in education, childcare, and other services that support the um, development of human capital. Every person is important. They don't have what I call throwaway people. Everybody is valued. And then finally they have really strong labor force protections and, and, a, and a strong social safety net. So these are all things that make people feel secure uh, in their countries. So in summary, the Nordic model emphasizes society-wide risk sharing and the use of a social safety net to help workers and families adapt to the changes of the overall economy. So the risk sharing is we all pay in, we all get the services. So we concluded the Nordic model appears to be working and has support in all the countries that we visited, but it has ebbed and flowed over time. And if you read George Lakey's book, you'll see that sometimes these governments go a little bit astray and they suddenly say, well, maybe we don't need such high taxes and maybe we can skimp or so on. And then the people seem to come back and say, no, no, that's not what we actually wanted. That's not what, so. Um, ebb and flow. But in general, over 100 years, the Nordic model has, uh, has held strong. So I'm going to go through a little section here talking about specifically some of the benefits that they, uh, they enjoy there and give you a few samples of them. This is a, a partial list here. Starting with education, which is absolutely key. Uh, Dana, the um, building at the top is the technical center. There's the front door, uh, similar to Hannaford Center here. Uh, there's an elementary school, and on the right is, is uh, a university building. So these are all in Iceland, incidentally. So that there's a lot of investment in education in the physical part of it. Now, we all know that uh, family leave is not something that we enjoy. Paid family leave is not something that we enjoy in, in this country. See the big fat zero there for the United States. 
All developed countries have at least some. Some have a great deal. So the Nordic countries are leaders in uh, supporting families for medical emergencies or anything else you might need for family leave. Uh, child care is subsidized or paid completely depending on the age and depending a little bit from country to country, but it's something that's believed to be uh, critically important, right from, uh, from birth, actually. Uh, we hear a lot about universal health care. Uh, it seems to be very elusive in this country. It's taken for granted there. Again, there are variations for all of these things from country to country, but the basic principle is that everybody has access to health care that they can depend on and can afford. Also, caring for the elderly, they try to keep people in their homes as much as they can, and when they can't, they have institutions that they, they're very good and tax-supported. And people are guaranteed to have find the financial means to live a decent retirement. Uh, this is a, an inside view of that technical school, technical high school, uh, where they uh, provide training for all kinds of, uh, well, all kinds of trades and, and skills that people, that young people need. In Iceland, this picture is from Iceland, they have particular emphasis on um, diesel technology. That's somewhat ironic. But uh, the fishing industry is very important there. So that's, uh, and the job market in Iceland is so good that a lot of people don't bother to graduate. They just, uh, but then the other thing uh, there about workforce retraining is that if you're mid-career, you can take courses at this institution or similar ones at no cost. The Europeans are famous for parklands and open space and making um, making you feel close to nature, making that accessible. Um, in Iceland, it's dark and cold much of the year, so you need indoor facilities, and that's what you see on the little left-hand picture there. The picture at the top there is outdoors. It's an outdoor swimming pool, and it's wintertime. But the water is geothermally heated. And they also have a ski area. All of these are uh, heavily, heavily subsidized. And, of course, Europe is famous for having robust public transportation. I will say that we did discover a few uh, gaps. It's really, really good in urban areas. In rural areas, it's not necessarily so good. Uh, but. Uh, in most places, you can you can walk or ride your bike uh, or find some sort of public transportation. Incidentally, on this trip, we did we stuck with uh, ground transport whenever we could and used public transportation whenever we could. So the picture on the left is from Copenhagen, where we've heard that 50% of the people commute by bicycle. They commute by bicycle year-round. And this frame actually came from a video that we took when, they, when the light turned green. There was just a flood of bicycles. It just went by. Very good bicycle infrastructure and also pedestrian infrastructure. So they have great public libraries, they've got wonderful museums. And you want to go back? Air. Is that, that's the new library in Middlebury. Actually, Fran is prompting me from the side to, to um, this library, the one with the pillars in front of it, the other one I, I think is from the uh, technical center, but the one with the pillars in front of it is the public library in Akureyri in Iceland, and they had a cafe in it. So, and it was wonderful, we had lunch there once, and uh, it was a great combination. So, museums, a um, lot of cultural history, and great museums, and also outdoor museums. When we weren't interviewing people, we did as much as we could to learn about the culture. And the outdoor museums in late October, November are cold. <laughs> so the way they pay for this, as we mentioned several times, is taxes. These figures compare the taxes in a country to its gross domestic product. 
and you can see the laggard over there on the right is the United States at 27 percent, which is less than half of what Norway, the tax taxes paid by Norwegians. In the United States, there's a lot of complaint about it. In Norway, Denmark, Sweden, and Iceland, we really did not hear complaints about taxes. In fact, I remember one uh, one person saying. I don't mind paying the taxes as long as I know what I'm getting for it. And another one said, uh, I think it's fair. So we're now going to go to Denmark, and Franz can tell you about a uh, special town there. Okay, that was the sort of the overview of the, the four, four countries, but then we, we spent extra time in this, this town and then one more town. So this, this is Samso right here in the center of Denmark, and they like to say it's in the center of Europe and the center of the world. They're very proud of their island, and rightly so. We're going to show you a little video now, a three-minute video to um, give you an introduction. Green energy is touted as the future if we want to stop global warming. But pledging a commitment to renewable energy is one thing, and doing it is another. So just over there on the horizon is Samso Island. Now they are officially 100% renewable. That means they get all of their energy from renewable sources. So we're going to go over there and meet the community and find out how they did it. I've heard that the system the islanders have set up is so efficient that it produces more power than they need. Not only does this enable them to be carbon negative, but also to make a profit by selling energy to the Danish mainland. I'm meeting Soren Hermansen, who heads up the Samso Energy and Environmental Organization. All right. It's, uh, Soren. Finally here, yes. Hi. Hi. Soren. Nice Hi. to meet you, Russell. Yeah, yeah. Thanks good for to see you. The weather's nice today. Beautiful. It yeah. is, yeah. Electric car. Yeah. Excellent. He's taking me on a private tour of the island. So when they say it's 100% renewable, I mean, is that true? Like 100%? I mean, we still have some fossil fuel consumption. Uh, tractors are driving. We have combustion engine cars also still. But we export about 80,000 megawatt hours every year. Wow. Yeah. That's incredible. Yes. There are 4,000 people on the island, and over the past 20 years, they've moved from a reliance on fossil fuels to wind, solar, and biomass technologies. From wind alone, they produce enough energy for themselves and the usage of 20,000 other homes. So, why, why was it set up, and why here on Samso? Actually, the, the, the beginning of it was very interesting because it was a top-down decision. We had a very ambitious minister of the environment, and he announced that Denmark would cut down 21% of the, of the present CO2 emission, which was really interesting because I was the first person that was hired to do this project. And I remember the feeling that I was sitting down and having the office, and I plugged in the, the telephone, and I said, gosh, man, how, how are we going to do this? <laughs> The community here have come a long way and now boast a carbon footprint of negative 12 tons per person per year. But getting to this stage wasn't easy. People were concerned about the impact of uh, all these big inst installations on this little island. And to convince people that this was good, we started thinking about using the old uh, cooperative ownership model where people kind of buy in they buy a share, a small share, or a bigger share, depending on how much money they have, and thereby invite them to participate in the ownership. So that you feel that I'm, I'm, I'm the part owner of the wind turbine, so therefore, it's, it, 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 because of me, it's there. God, it's not okay. All right. So I'll just fill in a little bit more uh, about the, the, the history of this, the 10, the 10 years. It's been 20 years since they started this, but the, this is just a 10-year timeline. So in 1997, you may remember the UN Climate Conference in Kyoto happened, and that's where this energy minister, Sven Auckland, attended 
and said, well, what can we do in Denmark? So uh, they, he dreamed up this idea of an energy community competition. And four, four communities applied. They gave him grants to do the planning. And SAMHSA made a master energy plan for, to make this uh, happen. And they won. But they, then they really didn't know how they were going to do it, as Soren said, like exactly how. So they won the competition. Oh, right, there was no money with it. <laughs> because if you give them money, then it's not, it's not uh, they can't normalize that, and they can't do that in other communities. So they just, they could use the same grants that every other community could have, but they didn't get any extra money to do this. Which they knew ahead of time, I think. But I think they were surprised to win. Um, so in 1999, they started uh, weatherization and renewable energy campaigns across the islands because they wanted to start reducing their energy use. And then in 2000, they erected 11 onshore wind turbines. So those are the ones that you could see. And in 2005, they, they put 10 more, this time offshore wind turbines. And in 2005, they had their, their renewable energy goal was achieved and exceeded. Jeez. So that didn't even take 10 years. And then in 2006, Soren and some, a few other people started the SAMSO Energy Academy. So it was quite an achievement. So how we, they talk about this, and we really wanted to analyze this. Like how, how were they so successful? Well, first of all, they had an ambitious goal. That's where it all starts. If you don't have a goal, then you're never going to achieve it. They used a collaborative community decision-making, and they employed the co-op model. So community ownership, local ownership. It's not owned by some big out-of-state company. Each person in the community who wanted to could get a bank loan, or if they had the money, they could buy a share of these wind turbines. And then, after they had achieved that goal, they started the Energy Academy, and they've been exporting this model all over the world. They do consulting, people come to them. So, like us, we learn about it, we come and we find out about it, and we're um, energized. But today we were there, one of the days, there was a school with a lot of students, uh, high school and postgraduate students from Japan were there, having, having a, uh, spending a day with them. And finally, there was a lot of job creation from this. Trades people, uh, builders, architects, um, and a lot of tourists. And so you, you require uh, that they're actually, they've got more jobs there on the island now than they had before. It's a problem because it's, it's small and isolated. So they're worried about losing their, their uh, adults, uh, their young adults. <laughs> So I want to show you a couple of things about, about this success. This, this right here, they call this sort of a Viking circle, group decision making, and it's very, um, everyone is equal. No one sits on a, on a, uh, you know, on a stage and, and says, this is how it's going to be. They're not, the experts, if they have experts, they sit in the back, they let the people talk and decide. What are we going to do? Where would we like, what would we like to do? When? Okay. Where would we like to put it? Everybody had input. Everybody. Until they could decide. And that's what helped them to be so accepting of those, those uh, big wind towers. So here they are. We actually walked under those. They hardly make any noise whatsoever. They're on farmland and people are making money from those. That's like the farmer who posted it. He's, yeah, he leased the land to them, right. So after they had gotten all this renewable energy from wind, then they said, okay, what else can we do? So they built, they built a lot of solar powered um, installations and that's their municipal garage and all those cars are uh, electric cars and they're used by nurses and social workers and so on who work for the town who um, go, all around and then you come back and they plug in and go on the next day. They also, this is very important, they have district heating which means that in the four sort of more concentrated areas like the villages, they burn this straw and turn it into hot water and that pipe to people's homes. 
Now, it sounds a little weird to be burning straw, but actually the straw was being burned on the fields by the farmers and just kind of wasted. So now they, they're paying the farmers for this straw and they're bringing it in uh, in, a, in a more controlled environment. And then they have one also that burns wood chips. And they told us that if another technology that's better comes along, we will definitely switch to it. We're not stuck with this but that we're using what's there. We're not inventing the technology, we're just using the best that we can find. So they got rid of a lot of oil burners with this district heat. All right, then there were some houses outside the district heating areas and they had their own special challenges. And so this house, uh, they had complete weatherization and retrofitted inside and there's a heat pump and solar. So these people are approaching uh, net zero for their all their heating costs. So then we come to the Energy Academy, and um, this was designed and built on the island by local people. It's net zero, and they use this house to, uh, you know, to educate people about about um, what you can do with um, architecture and good building design. So they do have some challenges that they're still trying to solve, and one of them is transportation, as he said. People are still using fossil fuels to drive. Now, the, the bus system is great, but it's not quite frequent enough. So they have this little van that goes around, and you can call and if it's off hours, and they come to pick you up. But if it's a busy day, you might wait. So transportation. And then they have several ferries. And believe it or not, they use their, they use their extra money from, the, um, you know, from selling all that electricity, and they bought a ferry and they run on biodiesel. And they're hoping to do more of that. There's more than one ferry that goes back and forth. So these people are, you know, they think, they think big. So finally, I um, just wanted to say that this is an old windmill, which they're very proud of because it shows uh, that wind and wind power is a part of the history, so it ties the past to the present. So that's it for SAMHSA. I'm sure you're all aware that the, each of these four countries has its own language and they claim not to understand each other. And no, we're not multilingual. Uh, they all speak English. So that's how we made it through four distinctive Nordic countries. So we're going to jump over to Iceland now. And Iceland, uh, the village or the city actually that we visited is Akureyri, which you see in the far north. And it's a, well, I'll describe the city in a minute, but just notice that uh, there's not, there, there's very little development between Akureyri and Reykjavik. In fact, um, probably a, many of you have been to Iceland and know that 80% of the whole population of the country is in the Reykjavik area. And then I think Akureyri is another 11%, so there's 8 or 9% that are scattered throughout the rest of the country. So most of the country is undeveloped and uh, Akureyri in particular is quite isolated. Oh, by the way, the total population of Iceland is 330,000. <laughs> so Akureyri is, is located on a very, very spectacular fjord with mountains all around. It's quite compact. Uh, it's, it's in the uh, low-lying area in front of that mountain and um, 18,000 people live in fairly close proximity. Now I'm going to talk a little bit about how they came to run a campaign called Carbon Neutral City. Uh, that's a source of great pride and the first thing that happened was in the 1980s they began to develop geothermal district heat for their homes and businesses. Now they were not doing this at the time out of environmental reasons. And I can't remember if Fran mentioned this or not, but in, in the other countries, they all got a wake-up call. Well, we did too, but we ignored it. They got a wake-up call in the 1970s with the energy crisis. And most of these countries, this was before Norway had discovered oil, uh, most of the Nordic countries were extremely dependent on outside sources for their energy. So as a matter of national security, they felt they needed to develop domestic sources of energy. And once again, they looked at what they had, and guess what Iceland has? 
It has geothermal. Now, geothermal is available wherever the magma is close to the surface, and in Iceland it's not only close, but sometimes gets above the surface. Uh, but where there's hot rock under the earth and an aquifer above it, the water becomes heated or even superheated. And you can drive a well down to it and get hot water. And the hot water can be piped straight into a community and used for district heat. And that's what the part on the left indicates. Or it can be used to drive turbines and create electricity. So they do both of these things in Iceland. But it would be a mistake to think that it's just there and pick it up and make use of it. It requires a lot of infrastructure. Uh, Fran is talking to our host in Akureyri, in, and in the background you see the insulated pipe that runs all the way from the well down to the city. It's uh, at least 10, maybe 15 kilometers away, so quite, a, quite an undertaking to get it there. And our friend there, Gudmundur, explained that they were early on in the technology and they didn't know as much about exploring for geothermal as we do now. And they drove several wells that were not successful, almost bankrupted the city, he said. So there's significant risk as well. It's not, uh, it's not as simple as it might seem. And if you're going to generate electricity, you need to build a plant. Again, lots of infrastructure. Uh, we, they can even use it to heat sidewalks. We happen to see this in, under construction in Reykjavik, and I couldn't resist taking a picture of it. Uh, but of course, it means you don't have to use a sidewalk plow. So it does have some environmental implications as well. Uh, roughly 50% of the electricity in Iceland is generated from hydro. But that is not without controversy. Uh, obviously, there are environmental concerns about hydroelectric development, and there are people in Iceland who want to do more and more and more. So that's, that is a contentious issue in Iceland uh, with environmental groups resisting any further development. In fact, Iceland has more than enough electricity. Uh, they basically use it as an economic development tool. So, um, Fran mentioned earlier that although Iceland is not a member of the European Union, it is influenced by it through various trade agreements and, and just trading arrangements. So, they do have to adhere to many of the regulations. So, in the early 2000s, they uh, banned organics and animal waste in landfills. And then they began to do recycling. We saw recycling bins like this in many public buildings throughout Akureyri. In uh, 2009, they built a compost facility. And actually, the impetus behind this was that they could no longer put carcasses of animals from the slaughterhouses into the landfill. So they had to compost them. So that's actually how it got started. But they take all kinds of organic and uh, other kinds of organic... Um, carbon or well, waste like that paper that you see there. But they take animals, uh, yard and garden, parkland, uh, food waste, and compost it and create this product here. Now, compost or the materials for the composting facility are picked up by the city, paid for by taxes, and any citizen can go and pick up compost and take it home or spread it on their um, agricultural fields, and there's no charge for that. You just have to pick it up yourself. So then, uh, the next thing they did was in 2010, they set up a biodiesel um, plant. One of the clever little things they have is this funnel, which can be screwed onto a standard soda bottle or anything like that. And uh, so they encourage homes, people in their homes, when they're done cooking with oil, to pour it through this funnel into any kind of jar and recycle it by taking it to one of these bins. They, they're stationed around the city and then they come around and pick it up and that's part of what goes into their biodiesel. Obviously they use uh, waste from restaurants and, and food processing plants as well for that. Next thing was the local landfill had to be closed 
um, and they had a new landfill that was quite a long ways away, I think around 250 or 300 kilometers away, so it's expensive to truck things back and forth. So that gave them more impetus to recycle more and minimize waste. But since they had a closed landfill, they decided to tap it for methane. And on the left you see an automobile that runs on methane, that's their processing plant. Uh, they have methane uh, pumping stations around town. There's a bus, uh, one of the city buses getting uh, tanked up with methane. By the way, the bus system in Akureyri is free. And even some private, uh, the private shopping center has, uh, has a fleet of uh, methane fuel vehicles. So, there were all these initiatives going on, but they were not coordinated in any way. They weren't actually explicitly environmental until they began to get a sense, especially with the pressure from the EU, that there are envi environmental uh, implications for this. So they decided that they really needed to form an organization that would pull all these things together, coordinate what was going on, and make a more coordinated plan for the future. And that's when they came up with the idea of branding their city as carbon neutral Akureyri. Again, it's similar to what Fran said about SAMHSA. If you have a goal, it's easier to get people galvanized to work on it. So here's a timeline summarizing the kinds of things that they have done over about a 10 year period um, and the organization they formed is called the Storka. It's housed in, in this plant, in this building and it is funded by the municipally owned electric utility, Nordoroka. So conceptually what they are trying to do in Akireri is, is capture all materials flow, all sources of carbon, and make more use of them. Instead of throwing stuff away, recycle it, or turn it into biodiesel, or uh, find a way to, um, to make sure that you extract all the energy out of it that you can and have the minimal amount of waste. Again, this is our host with a uh, poster next to him showing the things that they've done, the many areas of progress that they've, they've made so far, and there's actually, we have a single brochure from Historica in the back there that uh, outlines some of the things that they hope to do in the future. They do, however, have some remaining challenges, and uh, air, transit, air, air transportation is one of the big ones because it's, it's so far from Reykjavik, it takes six or seven hours to drive from uh, Akureyri to um, Reykjavik. We know because we took the bus and that took, I think, eight hours, seven or eight. Took a long time. And <laughs> so people tend to fly and also Icelanders feel sort of cooped up and sort of feels that they ought to get off the island at least once a year. So air travel is still a puzzle and there are a lot of internal combustion cars still running around. They, they are selling a lot of electric cars now and they don't, uh, there's no import tax and the first $47,000 of the price of an electric car in Iceland is free of the VAT, in effect the sales tax. So if you buy uh, a lower range um, electric vehicle, you basically get it for no, no taxes, and then the taxes cut in, but they're much lower than they are. They're punishing taxes for uh, internal combustion engines. But one of the big um, resistors is the rental car companies, because they don't, you know, tourists come to Akureyri and they see that there's a road all the way around the island and they want to take that road, and they don't want to have range anxiety. So they know they're probably never going to get rid of all of the carbon fuel. So they have an active carbon sequestration program. This is a picture from the city park. These trees have been, I'm not sure how old these trees are, but they, they started a program called the Green Scarf. The Green Scarf. Uh, with lots of walking trails and active uh, tree planting programs, and they actually hope that they will be able to sell wrecks into the 
based on the carbon sequestration to help finance further projects. So we think there are some things, some lessons that we can apply right here in Addison County from Accurated. We have a similar scale here in Addison Co in County, and I think we have a strong local identity. We have very accessible government entities. Like Accurary, there are a lot of things that are already happening in this county in, in terms of environmental consciousness. We have an electric utility that's progressive and willing to, to work with us on, on things that we need to do to lower our carbon impact. We have a local transit system. Our local college, Middlebury College, as you know, is working hard on its own carbon footprint and willing to collaborate with, with uh, the townspeople as well. And in Vermont, the renewable energy sector has a proven record of job creation. So we have an organization here called SEAC, Climate Economy Action Center, which is one of the sponsors tonight. And we're wondering, is there a role for SEAC that's similar to Vistorca? Can we get together and coordinate all our efforts? So, Fran, I think you were going to cover yeah. this. All right. So, looking at the big picture now, not just from these two towns, but the, everything that we've looked at, um, we think that the fair taxation and the moderate income disparity helps to build consensus in the society. People aren't always thinking somebody's getting more than I am or I have to keep up with somebody else. Um, bringing communities together uh, to discuss how they make key climate related decisions results in better outcomes in the end. Setting mandatory climate goals with measurable steps along the way is how we make progress with climate change. And then the important ownership question, public and co-op ownership of uh, these installations helps to helps uh, them to respond to the climate crisis. So this is my theory on how these two things work together, the Nordic model and their response to climate change. My theory, and I is just unproven, but I've, I think that a highly functioning society and faith in government allows these countries to tackle complex problems like the climate crisis. They're not always fighting with each other. And they're not trying to score political points. They really are working together. And so people aren't anxious the way people are here all the time about something. So that's, that's my theory about why they're so far ahead on the climate crisis. I don't know if it's true or not, but... So, um, again, we want to emphasize that they are using the resources that they have for renewable energy. In SAMHSA, it was wind, solar, and biofuel, and they're looking at other things also. And then aquarium, geothermal, hydro, methane, biofuel, and then all the different ways that they did that. So they used what they have, and they're very different, but they, they used what they had. So we're saying we could do it our way. There are cultural differences between our country and their countries, obviously, but we should be thinking about the way we can adapt our and their ideas, uh, good ideas to hear right here in Vermont. All right, so this is the big disclaimer. It, maybe we made it look too good that everything's perfect there. It's not. People there on the street are pushing for faster action. We all know Greta Thunberg comes from Sweden. She's not happy with what's going on in her country. She spent every Friday uh, in front of the parliament doing school strikes and she started school strikes all over the world. So you can see here on the the left hand slide that's Oslo, There's they're protesting drilling for oil in the Arctic. Okay, they, they're adamantly against that. And on the right here they're saying we need to make faster progress. We have great goals but we aren't working fast enough. So this says an ambitious climate goal, an uh, ambitious climate law now. And on the right, we haven't said much about climate justice, but climate justice is something they take very seriously because they know that 
the countries and the people that had the least to do with causing the climate crisis need the most help. And their countries have all pledged to help these other countries financially. Um, and they're saying, it's not happening fast enough, we're not doing enough. We have all these resources, we're rich countries, we should be doing more. We should be reducing our carbon footprint, yes, but what about those countries that are already uh, in need of help? So, uh, I want to read a little section from Greta Thunberg's book. No one is too small to make a difference. We were given this book by a professor at the University of Stockholm. They're very proud of Greta, even though she's criticizing them uh, relentlessly. <laughs> so, avoiding climate breakdown will, will require cathedral thinking. We must lay the foundation while we may not know exactly how to build the ceiling. Sometimes we just simply have to find a way. The moment we decide to fulfill something, we can do anything. And I'm sure the moment we start behaving as if we were in an emergency, we can avoid climate and ecological catastrophe. Humans are very adaptable. We can still fix this. But the opportunity to do so will not last for long. We must start today. We have no more excuses. All right, so we always have to end with what can you do, what can I do, what can we do? There's always more we can do, so we have some ideas. This is my pet cause right now, supporting the Vermont Legislators Climate Solutions Caucus. How many of you have been to one of these or are following this Climate Solutions Caucus? Okay, this is, this is big in Vermont right now. Um, and I have some flyers in the back, you can take one home about encouraging the governor of Vermont to support the Climate Solutions Caucus. Uh, you can join uh, or support any of these climate organizations uh, at a local, state, or national level. You can follow George Lakey and Bill McKibben and some of the students at the college uh, and become part of a nonviolent direct action campaign. Bill McKibben is, is sitting in with, at, at big banks. That's his new thing. So. Yes, because they finance fossil fuels. Um, things you can do as an individual or as a family. I'm really big on this one. Get outside in nature. Immerse yourself in what, we're, what we care about. We haven't said a lot about plants and animals uh, today, uh, but we have this wonderful planet that we, we care about. So let's get outside and experience what we're trying to save. You can measure... Um, and systematically reduce your own carbon footprint. Everybody can do that. You can find it online. Maximize home energy efficiency. Make good transportation choices. Everybody should be thinking about what is my budget, carbon budget for, for transportation. Things like what kind of car do I drive? How many do I use public transportation? How many airplane rides am I taking per year? That's your carbon budget, that's your transportation budget. So if you make good transportation choices, you can start reducing that. Make good food choices, reduce your consumerism, and divest your finances from fossil fuel companies. And the most recent one we've learned about is credit cards. If you have a credit card, it probably is with a bank that supports, that invests in fossil fuels. So uh, we're in the process of looking into that personally right now. So, this is uh, almost at the end. And time to thank our sponsors, SEAC, the Climate Economy Action Center, which is a 501c3, which was organized a year ago and is dedicated to deep carbon reduction and for providing businesses and individuals in our county with a way to thrive in a new low carbon or no carbon business future. And ICANN, Interfaith Climate Action Network of Addison County, is an ad hoc group of representatives from religious, uh, religious groups in our county who meet to exchange ideas and undertake some projects in our county to raise awareness about climate change. So, we're, you want to say something? Okay. Um, we're going to take questions in a minute. Um, 
We have another another project that I wanted to mention. Anna Burns, who's right in the middle here, she has some she has a project she's doing on uh, tree planting in Cornwall. So she's brought some uh, on the table on the left here. She's brought some brochures if you're interested in learning about carbon sequestration through planting trees. And um, SEAC has brochures, and we also have a few um, interesting things that we picked up in the different cities we were in, Stockholm and Samso and so on. There's an, a neat children's book there also. So um, I guess we're ready for questions, right? Oh, yes, I have my brochures about calling the governor. Yes. <laughs> They're on the table there also. So, we ready for questions? We'll take questions, but not all at once. <laughs> yes. This is just a comment, actually. No, not a comment, an announcement about what something that could go on your list that was back there, and that is, what can we do? And uh, the Climate Caucus is asking for more people to show up at the State House and be able to be in the committee rooms when they're talking about these different things about pushing some of those bills forward. They really like citizens to be there, so so they they're really um, encouraged to move forward. You know, by having people there, really watching the conversation and even piping up, really helps. And there's a group of four or five people who live in Montpelier who are organizing that. I've forgotten the name of the little group, but it's something that's really helpful if you're interested in a particular bill to actually go to the state house and. Sally, how would we, uh, how do we know, um, yeah, they, they, they meet on Thursdays, I know, they meet on Thursdays. And what they do is they send out a list of what's going on at the State House each week. Oh, these guys, yeah, the whole fun comments. They would, I would imagine someone there knows who's organizing this calendar of what goes on each week, so you know what's happening in this room and that room, and you might be interested, oh, I'd, I'd like to go there. Then it would be great to get a carpool so that we could do it without <coughs> Each going in our separate cars. So did everybody hear all that? Maybe I could send it to you. Oh, it's through VCAN. Okay, Vermont Energy and Climate Action Network. Okay, so more questions. Thanks so much for the presentation. Um, I was curious whether there was any respect that the communities you went to were actually were out in front of their national governments and were being held back by the policies in these countries which are so far in advance of ours and whether um, they told you anything about sort of sister communities in places like the UK or Germany or the, the local communities that were really ahead of their national governments instead of um, you know working uh, in, within an environment where there's a little bit of wind at their back from above. I do know uh in Iceland, in Akureyri, one of the one of the organizers we spoke to said said that they are they feel they're ahead of their government somewhat, and that and I know we heard a couple times people saying our government isn't working fast enough; it's not letting us do what we want to do. But um, Stockholm and Oslo, those two cities, are far out ahead of it seems like anybody else. Um, and as far as sister cities, did you know about that? I don't know about that, but I, I think it's a generalization. The rural areas do tend to lag a bit. Anything else? Yes, Ross. You mentioned during the talk, Fran, that there was some uh, fading in and out of the support for taxation. Was that with the, the people or with the government? Well, you can't really separate it because they would vote these people in and then the government would, would, uh, would do some things that, that, you know, they would sort of swing more towards the banks and, and so on. So, but what would uh, cause them to switch back? Uh, the people. Then they would be voted out of office. Okay, so it sounds like perhaps they have a more robust democracy than perhaps we're enjoying here. <laughs> <laughs> well, you know, it is, it is very... Um, different there because they have so many parties. There are like 10 parties or 12 parties and they have to have coalitions. So they have to work together. It's rare that one party ever wins an election. So they have to work together. And so you could be voting for the center party or the social democratic party, but they both would be working together on carbon reduction. 
what's the percentage of folks that vote? Do you know? I was confused. You're not allowed to ask questions we don't have answers to. <laughs> uh, I, my, anecdotally, I think the, the percentage is very high. That there really is real participation. But I, I mean, the answer is that, that these things ebb and flow in political currents. And capitalism is very alluring. So every once in a while, they'll go down that road and, and capitalism will flourish for a little while. And then when something goes wrong, the people do react and vote for a different government. So that, that really think they do, they do have a closer tie to their government because of the way it's structured. You might have heard about the, the, the crisis in Iceland when the banks, uh, you know, suddenly started doing these loans and it just, oh, it was horrible. Well, the people came out and they said, well, we're not paying for this. The banks did this. We're not going to pay through it. Through taxes and they had a pots and pans revolution and they all went out and stood in front of the legislature and banged in their pots and pans so that they, no business could be done. And they absolutely would not countenance that. And then in the end they gave in and they said, okay, you're going on your own, the banks, we're not going to bail out the banks. Yeah. <laughs> yeah, I was curious about how, how they deal with disputes and tribalism, so that the different opinions and, and groups that form in these societies. It's different than what we do. Do you have any thoughts on that? How do they, how do they get to these coalitions? Oh, you mean on the, the political level? Well, they, they sort of have to. You know, I mean, at one country we were in, it took them several months to get their government together because they had all the different parties and they negotiate and they... Have you ever seen the, the TV show Borgen? Yes. <laughs> Borgen. They, they go on and on and they meet and yes, I can do this. No, that I can't. That was Denmark. Yeah, that was Denmark. Okay. So... There's a lot of bargaining that has to go on, but the people seem to be, they get on the streets, you know, if, if something's not working. But as far as tribalism, you... Well, George Leahy does say that, that uh, Norway, uh, in, in particular, because of the geography, it has many, many different dialects, and there it's difficult to understand from one to the other. So yes, there is a certain amount of tribalism in, in Norway, but... We didn't hear that as a general... I mean, I, I think Denmark is clearly the one that's the most together. They, they have eight parties represented in, in their parliament, and seven of them have agreed to pass this law that they want, which I can't remember exactly what the goal is, but it's, it's very aggressive. And there's one party that doesn't want to move that quickly, but they do agree that they need to work on it. So, you know... The, where their disagreements are are sort of at a different <laughs> level altogether from our disagreements in this country. Did you have something? Yeah. It, it, the next big round of national and international climate action is around Earth Day this year, April 22nd. There will be three days of international activity. You want to tap into that. 350.org is organizing that. And the big campaign that Fran referred to is called Stop the Money Pipeline. And this is building, building on the success of the divestment movement, which has been enormously successful all over the world. Also, if you want to hear more about the Climate Economy Action Center, of which a couple of us are board members, CEACAC.org, Climate Economy Action Center of Addison County. And we have a, an event coming up on... Uh, I think it's going to be March 9th. Yes, anything else? One other related event happening next week is at the Marquee Theater. Um, student journalists are giving their little film shorts about a tour they took across the U.S. to look at housing, uh, tiny house villages, and how that is an economical and environmental um, solution to housing problems and, and affordability. And that's happening at Marquee Theater at uh, Wednesday, January 29th at 6 o'clock. Um, and it'll be a discussion will happen after because they're planning to try to do something locally. They want to take what they learned and see what can happen here to create some affordable economic environmental housing. Uh, 
Uh, more? Well, just relatedly, if you're going to go to an event like this, which is great to see all these people here, you know, or to an event like that, one thing you could do is practice coordination by finding out who you can carpool with <laughs> to get to that event. It's good muscle in coordination, you know, with a lot of benefit. So I encourage that. Okay, Anna? I'm going to go over here and stand beside my neighbor, <laughs> my other neighbors that came with us in a carpool. <laughs> uh, Fran mentioned that we have a, we're exploring, we're exploring something in Cornwall because I've been stewing in my own juices and having nightmares and other things for months now. What can we do? What can we do? And you did go through a lot of things that we can do individually, but what we want to explore as a community is carbon sequestration, restoration of wetlands, cleaning the water, and creating a wildlife corridor. And we live at Foot Farm in Cornwall, and we're going to plant a shitload of trees. Invite us over. Well, I have a little thing back here. I, I asked Fran how many I had to print. She said 25. <laughs> so I have 60 of these. My email address is on them. We're gonna, we're gonna, we have the help of um, the U.S. Fish and Wildlife Service and the U.S. Forestry people and the county forester. They're coming over tomorrow to look at the land. And then our homeowners association will sit in a circle in March <laughs> and have a discussion about what we can do, how long it will take, what resources we have, what resources we can gather in the community. But we have um, on our personal property a lot, I mean a ton of little white pine seedlings. This size, this size, this size, this size. So if anybody wants to do carbon sequestration on their property, we have trees that we can give away. I mean, I encourage everybody to take it seriously about sequestering the carbon, not tilling your land. You know, look, educate yourselves about what you can do. There's, there's, I came to the library the other day with the children's section to see what they have here to teach children about climate change because we all went, we, some, some of you probably went, did anybody go to the Bill McKibben lecture for families? So I looked at what they have here and the, the newest thing they have is from 2008 on climate change. So I of course ordered a bunch of books, they didn't have them at the book store either except one thing. So there's lots of things we can do you know, that we don't have to get in a group to do, we can just do them. Some things we can get in groups to do. I, I, I'm, I'm frantic. To do Thanks, Anna. Well, um, you've all demonstrated the power of individual energy. You've raised the temperature in this room by, from an uncomfortable <laughs> level to maybe more than comfortable. But uh, thank you all for coming, and um, let's all get together and make this stuff happen.